Welcome to the Deep End by On Deck, a podcast where visionary builders, creators, and experts discuss world changing ideas. I'm your host, Marshall Kozlov. Let's dive in. Not only can you increase GDP by having fintech solve some of these problems to, in, to make the borders more porous, but more importantly, it is uh, much of the countries are driven by cash. And cash is a very, very expensive workflow and uh, very, just the nature of it, right? So now actually digitizing and doing all the thing, all the ancillary things around cash there, once you digitize it, hasn't been built out. And so this is happening at a really, really rapid pace here. And so we're focusing on this as well as on the crypto side of, hey, why does it even need to be in a web two kind of dimension? Could it be web three first? And so there are some parallel things there that are we're trying to maybe we'll, we'll, we'll bet on many horses because we're just not sure. But again, it is the directionally correct way to go about thinking about the problem. At the deep end, we're creating a space where we skip the surface level and go in depth into ideas that inspire people to build. I'll be your guide as we explore possible futures of internet communities, creator tools, climate tech, longevity, and much, much more. There are no experts in uncharted territory, only pioneers. The Deep End invites these trailblazers to turn their experiences into the knowledge and ideas that others need to start their own founder odysseys. Joining me this week in the Deep End is Abe Choi, a prolific angel investor and CEO of Simple Dealer. Abe has partnered with another high-profile angel investor named Olumide Soyombo to create Voltron Capital, a pan-African venture capital firm. This is our first pure VC episode in a while, and it was refreshing to hear about some of the dynamics on the venture side as opposed to the founder side. Africa is massive. One of our first questions that we asked Abe was about how his firm expects to develop a consistent thesis for the continent, given that it is so large, diverse, and spread out. He helps us learn how to think about the industries prime for growth and the regions that have developed innovative hubs throughout the continent. We discuss different private and public sector partnership models that are emerging and why fintech startups are especially promising. Abe also contrasts the investment from his firm with investment from China and our firms in Europe. This was a live episode recording and we had other angel investors in our live audience that supplied questions in the chat. If you'd like to be notified about future live episodes, be sure to sign up for our newsletter at thedeepend.substack.com. Abe Choi, welcome to The Deep End. Thank you for having me. Let's start with the most obvious question. Everyone knows the stereotype when it comes to language. Africa is a continent. It's not merely a country. It's incredibly big, diverse, varied. How should we conceptualize Africa in the same sense that we conceptualize the Asia Pacific region, Latin America, North America, Europe, et cetera? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's best to know that every place that you go is localized. So from the North American context, that would be saying Mississippi is equal to New York or Washington because they're part of the U.S., right? Or saying that uh, Mexico is equal to Argentina. And so this is where you got to be really, really careful about those nuances, not only from the language side and cultural side, as well as different kinds of uh, colonialism that has happened. So there's many different ingredients that make each of these countries very, very uh, unique to each other. Of course, there are overlapping uh, histories there, but they should be looked upon unique and that each they shouldn't be grouped into such a large uh, thing where you can't really make much sense of it from there. I love your two examples, Argentina and Mexico, Mississippi and New York. Despite the vast differences there, there still would be some use in grouping those categories together. Mississippi and New York, they're in the United States. Mexico and Argentina are Spanish-speaking countries. So what is the coherence beyond just pure geography as we think of Africa in a way that's still useful? Yeah. 
I think that you can still have some common denominators like what you would expect from an infrastructural point of view, whether that's physical infrastructure to uh, whether it's uh, the um, schooling system that has come from uh, from their colonies before as well. Uh, so there are very much common denominators, but I think in the spaces that we're talking about here of building technology companies and seeing what is on the edge here is that the local view is is going to be very, very helpful to understand how each one of these countries are solving that problem in their own way. And so even though you may have um, many English speaking countries or the Francophone countries, it's still very, very useful to view them separate, uh, just like you would view a brother or sister, even if they're twins, they're still separate entities themselves. What drew you to invest in Africa? You could tell a story about growth on a variety of different continents. You could tell a story about Latin America. You could tell a story about Southeast Asia, South Asia. What specifically about Africa represented the opportunity for you? It, it's two points here. One, from a professional reason where I was drawn to the continent. My first stint in Africa was in South Africa, where I was there for almost eight years. We had a consulting company there. And that's where I also got to meet my wife, who is actually Nigerian. She grew up in London, but uh, immigrated to London from Nigeria. So it is deeply personal as well as professional. And I really, really want to see how the continent can grow. And so this is where um, I believe that not only from my startup point of view of that's where our engineering is to the investing side to say, how do we ensure that we can create a deep, deep ecosystem as opposed to, you know, having to go to the North American or European markets to now uh, have a further funding round. would like to see how the ecosystem can grow deep from product managers that have 10, 20 years of uh, history there to being able to raise uh, the various tranches that come after just a seed round. This far into investing in the space, what do you think is the biggest misconception that interested outsiders hold? Yeah, I think I think we cover that just a little bit there in terms of thinking of about Africa as this amalgamated mass here. Um, the misconceptions I see is porting over an idea, maybe that you've seen work well, so maybe something like Uber for something, and thinking that just because they have this issue that it's gonna be a very simple copy and paste. And it's not that way. There's gonna be, whether it's regulatory to just even, uh, just even the belief of what you can do from intellectual property that makes even just beginning a startup that much more difficult. And so where you see the, a lot of African founders, you know, being able to succeed is that they just have the tenacity. They just have the grit there much, much more than, uh, let's say, uh, more of a mature market just because of everything is against them and mo they have an even higher chance of failing here. So you're, you're investing in a variety of markets, Nigeria, obviously, Kenya, South Africa. Could you describe the different countries that you've engaged with so far and then help us understand at an ecosystem level what industries, what problem sets, and what opportunities exist at a compare and contrast level? Yeah, so we have spoken to co uh, companies in Uganda, Tanzania, um, South Africa, um, Nigeria, Ghana, Egypt. And so it's all over Africa there. However, um, what the major trends we're seeing is a lot of fintech companies and and just a digitizing of paper or kind of just human duct tape workflow. So you can see that happening in healthcare to the banking side to even food where you have um, restaurant supplies being aggregated to also then where you would say this is a brex or a ramp for um uganda so you see lots of 
different kinds of companies now popping up because we are in this much easier of a place to uh, create startups. Uh, but it is still very much early days. And, but on a high, high level, uh, lots of uh, fintech for us, but we are still agnostic. Here's a question. Why do we even need Brex for Uganda? Think of Web2 companies, think of Facebook, think of WhatsApp. These are, these are services and platforms that are used worldwide. We wouldn't think of the need for a social network for a specific country. What, what is it that drives the, the ability or the need for there to be locally grown version, versions of some of these apps? Yeah, I, I think it's around, again, the regulatory side that you do see companies kept within their borders, where I would say uh, some somewhere like the U.S. is very porous. So Mississippi is an approximate equivalent to an Alabama, as well as in Wisconsin to a New York City, a New York. However, uh, it's, I think, maybe closer to move east and go to Europe saying, is, um, is, uh, Slovakia the same as France. And so this is where now you have individualized local companies doing this. And then at the same time saying that they can spread faster in the European, uh, in the European continent, but still having troubles there. So this is where you're getting that localization first, but all of the companies have a continental view of, Hey, we can capture here because we understand and we have boots on the ground. And then once we have, uh, once we've been able to get to product market fit, we are then able to now scale out further and probably follow. If you're in a French speaking country, you're going to probably follow, uh, and go into all the other Francophone countries, but everyone is starting from one place and then scaling out from there. Something I'm really curious about when we think of the Chinese market in the 2000s, because desktop computing wasn't as much of a thing in the 1990s, the Chinese market was able, was able just to skip straight to mobile, which led to a frankly much um, higher state of mobile products when you're thinking of things like WeChat, Alipay, et cetera. Is there a similar opportunity in the African context for us to move beyond, to just leapfrog the need to use legacy systems? How do you think of that dynamic in the African context? Yes, absolutely. Uh, there's leapfrogging is definitely happening. And so this is where hopefully uh, from our from our fund's point of view, Voltron, Illumide and I are thinking about uh, trying to build from the pieces that we understand and we've seen historically, but at the same time being very, very open and going, let's see what they can come up with, what they're trying to do. And again, there's this little bit of, I guess, this magic that also happens from the sense of going, what could be, and then being grounded in understanding what is actually happening in the country and why this is a relevant and important company that needs to exist and be built or at least funded. And hopefully, uh, even though it may be the wrong company, it is still the directionally correct bet. Speaking of the right companies, before y'all had started investing, what are some, what are just some early success stories that you all took note of and saw, hey, this can be scaled, this can be approached in a different context. Well, what are some just good examples that I want you to keep in mind of? Yeah, so um, some of the earlier wins that we, we've had as just angels here before we formalized was, I would say, uh, earliest investors into PiggyVest, which is now a very, very large fintech here. Uh, that's a Nigerian fintech there. And then uh, one of the kind of, I guess, um, more well-known names is Paystack and Stripe Bank buying out Paystack there for 200 million. And that was a great success where, uh, Illumide was one of the first angels there. And then now Shola is returning to the, uh, ecosystem. Shola is a CEO of Paystack and investing into companies himself and or becoming LPs of funds that are trying to deepen that ecosystem now. And this is a good question that comes up. Why are we focusing so much on fintech when we're having this conversation? Why why is it why does it seem like the opportunity is so concentrated in that specific industry? Yeah, I think um for us, fintech is not only something that was up and coming, um, but now is really for 
for Africa at large has shown how not only can you increase GDP by having um, finance uh, fintech solve some of these problems to in, to make the borders more porous, but more importantly, it is uh, much of the countries are driven by cash, and cash is a very very expensive workflow and uh, very, just the nature of it, right? So now actually digitizing and doing all the thing, all the ancillary things around cash there, once you digitize it, hasn't been built out. And so this is happening at a really, really rapid pace here. And so we're focusing on this as well as on the crypto side of, hey, why does it even need to be in a web two kind of dimension? Could it be web three first? And so there are some parallel things there that are we're trying to maybe we'll 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 bet on many horses because we're just not sure but again it is the directionally correct way to go about thinking about the problem speaking of your angel investing how do you think about risks when it comes to follow-on funding given that all these spaces and a lot of the ecosystem we're discussing here are so nascent yeah so from a Voltron point of view, we do not uh, double down just because we are investing in as many pre-seed and seed deals as we can. However, from we do do syndicate deals of where uh, now more than half of our portfolio have gone on to YC or tech, tech stars or 500 startups there where they want to raise and they want uh, they want let's say the angels that can help. And so they're looking for that smart money, those small checks that will help them that much more. So from a fund point of view, we don't do that. But from a syndicate point of view where there is interest, we will definitely help the companies uh, spread their or diversify up their angel investors there to see how much more help they can get now from these operator angels or solo GPs that are out there. We're kind of dancing around slash hinting at this, but I would just love to get your broad thoughts on crypto regarding the space and how you're thinking of the broader Web3 conversation. There's a lot contained within all of that, but we just love your just broadest, most expansive thoughts on that. I think the I think the biggest difference is that for maybe the mature markets, people will view crypto as an asset class. Um, you know, maybe I should have five, 10% of this risky asset in my portfolio. While from an emerging markets point of view, this is, uh, it, it's definitely looked upon as an asset, but is, I believe, first and foremost, an actual way to exchange value here in a very, very frictionless place where now you can do, uh, whether that's pay for goods, you're importing, exporting, uh, you have an import export service and because of that you don't have to worry about um, uh, FX and all of these other things that happen where you have regulatory bodies that are trying to um, potentially do regulatory capture or any other things that they just don't understand the business and are trying to get in the way and so now this is where crypto really disintermediates that so for uh, Africa at large I believe crypto is not just an asset class but it is actually fulfilling what crypto was meant to do originally where it is for the people and now anyone can do anything at any time uh, very very easily I was doing some reading about the fund and once again, this is marketing copy, so I'm not going to hold you too literally to it, but you know, in, in the fund's description, Africa is described as the last economic frontier. And as we're trying to capture the fact that you have engagement spread all across the continent, it would just be great to get a strong quasi analytical, but also just visual conception of what that last economic frontier looks like in the year 2021. Yeah, I think when I first wrote that on Twitter, it was a while back. So I'd like to say that um, I need to add a little bit more, uh, a little bit more dimension to that. Is that so? For for me, when I first said that, it was around the actual, just the physical geography, and this is when. Uh, I hadn't thought through crypto as much and where that could be, but that's more of, I think, kind of um, 
we're talking about potentially like derivatives of geography now as opposed to a real physical place. So for me, the last economic frontier was about, okay, we have, we have actual problems in these countries, whether it's because of the, of the government or it's because of where they are landlocked or whatever it may be. And if we can unlock this, then you are able to not only unleash talent, creativity, uh, solutions that are localized for that market, but you're going to have something, you're going to have this explosion. And so this is where the last economic frontier was very much based from that physical point of view of we got to solve these problems first before you can potentially even get onto the metaverse where this would definitely make things more efficient and maybe you are now able to disintermediate even more uh, of those middlemen. But for the time being, we haven't even solved the, let's call it layer one problems within that specific geography, that region, or within that country itself there. Can we actually get to... Once again, you've hinted at these, but we, I want to get to the, the literal um, facts on the ground. What are those exact layer one problems? And how do you delineate between problems that can be attacked through technology and startups and problems that are more related to governance, the public square, sociological things which aren't quite in the same category as what we're discussing here today? Yeah, so these are... These are some, these are some deep topics. Um, I wish I had the answers the for deep, all of this. The deep, yeah, we're not expect. Well, and yeah. here's the thing too, just to be just to be very clear, I'm more interested in your in your framework, not knowing the exact line by line of every single one, of course. Sure, sure. So, some of the examples would be things like a very simple thing would be intellectual property. In most places, it is. Um, it is only in theory, as opposed to if someone were to steal IP or do something, there's no recourse. There's, there's nothing that can be done, even though in theory, uh, the framework does exist. So this is now up to the entrepreneur to decide, is she going to risk all this time, all this sweat to do something that could just be in theory taken away from uh, a private individual and or the government? So this is where you have this kind of distrust. And so maybe this is where crypto could come in very, very easily because uh, they would now transcend these, transcend these issues. Uh, and then the very simple things are of like what we have already touched on, like cash, of just even moving cash around and being able to pay very easily. Uh, remittances, I guess this is being solved from many, many different companies. And as well, when I lived in Johannesburg, uh, I, I would, I would meet people that would, you know, basically when they were trying to send money from South Africa to Zimbabwe, uh, once it got to the village, about 47% of the cash would be gone from paying all the middlemen there. So this is where we have all these, what I would call these layer one problems where it's just the infrastructure itself to uh, potentially the things that are the intangibles like regulatory things that all must be solved in one way or another to then allow the ecosystem to flourish on top of these the Lego blocks here that would allow the ecosystem to actually move forward. There's a couple of different points I want to pick up on in no particular order. You mentioned entrepreneurs and you discussed grit as, as a character trait, but tell us more about the entrepreneurs, who you're encountering, where the ecosystem is finding and developing them. We can make a joke about the US and, and Stanford, but like, once again, like that's a joke which speaks at something around an actual pipeline. What does this look like in the African context in these countries you're encountering? So I think most of the, most of the guys and girls we found are, they're always just coming up against a problem. So for us, we don't really ask or like to try to figure out what is their educational pedigree or their family pedigree or whatever that may be. It really is around what is the story what's the team look like and us trying to s understand the problem at large of what they're trying to solve here. And that's about it. So it's, uh, I would say it is very much more 
merit based than it is you were uh, you, you were you know you were farmed within a system to hopefully your probability has gone up there. I think here uh, or on the continent it is much much more merit based, and we're absolutely wanting to talk to anyone that is going to uh, demonstrate that grit and that they're just going to make it happen. And then the other question here, and this is stepping a lot further back. I'm not expecting a perfect articulation of the opportunity in the metaverse in Web3, but what's very interesting is we're talking about a very specific physical geography. And when you talk to a lot of folks who are excited about the metaverse and other you know, broader Web3 topics, it's really just that the internet is this leveling field. We don't have to think about geographic constraints. You, in, you insert the statement about w remote work, asynchronous teams. How do you just broadly think about someone who woke up in a world where the internet just accelerated probably 10, 15 years to where it was going to be to the degree with geography maybe not mattering as much? I think, I think we live in a world of and, right? So even though the metaverse will happen and whether you are stuck in web two or you're going to move on to web three, we are always going to live in the world of and of where we have physical bodies. And this is where uh, culture comes in, where also culture is then a not an or, but more of kind of a matter of preference as opposed to some sort of universal truth. So. For me, this is going to be something of how how do we understand what is happening physically and or where a, let's say, a government body can force something to happen. So like in Nigeria right now, the CBN, which is the um, the regulatory body on uh, on finance, on fintech there where they've stopped crypto, even though crypto is the metaverse, the CBN can say, hey, uh, banks can no longer, you know, interact with uh, fintech companies that are using crypto. Then this is where now the real kind of geography does impact the world, the metaverse world there. And so this is where I believe, um, even though these opportunities are at large and you would love to, we would love to be able to say there is going to be no friction there. It is a world of and that we live in, and therefore there will be impacts on either side here. And we're going to have to figure out how to move more fluidly from one to the other. You know, that's interesting that you bring up banks. If I'm thinking of many of the pitches in North America and Europe, even Asia, when it comes to friction and problems, it's focused on legacy institutions often with hundreds of years of history and practice that don't make sense in an internet native world. What are the legacy equivalents, if any, in most of these contexts that you're looking at? I think that would be the same as the mature markets. And they, I believe that these mature industries or these mature companies like the banks have even less, um, they're even more risk adverse to working with startups and also because they're probably very close to monopolies, there's very little incentive. They want to continue the status quo. And so this is where you have the, the, the Davids of the world really butting heads very hard and trying to find workarounds and or um, doing their best to create partnerships. But at the end of the day, the, the power is ultimately with the incumbents there. So I think this is where the metaverse or crypto at large could come into play because it is decentralized and there is no one to ask permission from, but there will be these on or off ramps from the various points uh, that at some point they will have to, uh, they will have to deal with these entities. Speaking of entities, what do you think about slash have you encountered any promising private public partnerships when it comes to this space? Uh, I, I have not, I have not seen any PPPs uh, that are more on the tech side for us to deal with. They are very much more on the physical infrastructural side, whether they're, you know, uh, generating electricity to um, power the different kinds of power plants. One small anecdote I have is when I was going to the Serengeti and it, we were driving very late, there's no lights 
we, I don't even know if we were driving on a road, but then all of a sudden it was smooth. No, no bumping, no jostling. And I said, we're in the middle of nowhere. Why is it smooth? And they said, the Chinese are building a power plant. And so for them to get all the materials, they needed a smooth road. So they asphalted everything there. So this is where I think PPPs come in, but um, th this is, we don't deal with uh, the PPPs on the tech side so much, because again, I think given that they're incumbents, they see no incentive of doing so because for them it's suicide. I'm curious, especially because you are coming to us from London. I'm recording this in New York and North America, obviously, but to what degree is the European tech ecosystem, due to just the obvious distance question, equipped to fill gaps, engage with any type of delineation that would be really helpful? Can you clarify there, Marshall? Yeah, just to, 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 what, to what degree are, um, let's just say like tech incumbents from Europe versus tech incumbents from North America entering mm -hmm. the spaces that you're looking at. And is, and, is, and is there probably more of a European connection as you're thinking of, especially when you're making reference to Francophone countries, those different bits? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I think most of our portfolio has have domestic co-founders. So if it's a Nigerian company or a company that started in Lagos, it's most likely going to be heavily, heavily Nigerian founders. However, we do have founders that are uh, from the US or Europe, Europe. Um, but it's mostly around the guys that understand the market. They have had some sort of personal professional history within the country to truly get the problem. And therefore that's where we, we fund them. But, um, uh, there's no, again, we have no, we have no preference there. Let's talk for a second about risk. As you think of your portfolio and these opportunities, how would you define the risk and in invest when it comes to investing in African startups? I think the problems, I think the risk is the same, even though for maybe an outsider, it would look like a very risky thing. Um, I think that's only because the correlation of the opaqueness for us, given that Illumidae lives in Lagos, understands the community there, and then I I fly in every quarter or so is that not only do we have our professional lives there, but also our personal. And because of that, we're able to stay very, very close and kind of have uh, the, 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 the real pulse here. Let's also talk about um, COVID. Before, before I go there, audience, um, definitely, um, I'll be transitioning over to Q and a, if anyone has any, so keep either putting those in the chat or keep them in the back of your mind. But sp speaking of COVID, the, the conventional wisdom, which is, I think largely true at this point is that in the, at least in the North American context, COVID sped up trends and factors there are, were already occurring. It didn't inherently create anything new. It just meant that um, pressure points that probably weren't going to get hit for five years were hit a little bit earlier. How would you describe that type of experience when it comes to the African tech and startup context? Does it apply? Is it similar or is there something different here? Yes, definitely. I, I think that there is application the same way, but in some cases it was concentrated in some cases very it didn't really matter. So um, to be a little bit more specific there, uh, vaccinations and in terms of just trying to control um, immigration and things like this, it was very much more locked down given that there is a very little vaccinations available within the country. And so I would say not much really changed. So from my my friend's point of view, uh, wherever they are, it was, yes, we have lockdown, but life still goes on where we don't have drugs to rely on. And unless someone's going to just sit at home all day, uh, which they can't do, they just have to continue with the risk there. However, again, on the other barbell side where you see this concentrated effort is that now things have sped up. There's more of a belief of 
remote teams, but that's more on the startup side where saying we don't need a physical office and we can just do things remotely and we can accept this new world and maybe it's an even better world for us. Or once things settle down and vaccinations are more widely available, we can now move. So there's not necessarily a or here. I think it's just more of an and again, where just to, because what the emerging markets are not the same as the mature markets from uh, all the all of the above. They just had to deal with it the way they had to deal with it. Now, I'm going to start reading a couple audience questions that are actually very excellent questions here. This is from uh, Jackson. I'm curious how African grown startups think about building a moat to compete against North Americans, also European competitors trying to enter the African market. Abe referen mentions the fintech sector in Africa is strong, but it's strong everywhere. How do Africa first companies make sure their customers don't leave for foreign competitors once the competitors go to market? Yeah. So one is that there are country specific laws. So from a fintech perspective, uh, Ghana, Nigeria, and probably some of the other countries that I won't be listing here, they have uh, the uh, regulatory bodies will say, you must use a domestic uh, payment processor. So now that gives them protection in that way. But also, it is like a, um, a French company coming into the US, not saying that they can't be successful, but it is that much harder or a Portuguese company going into Eastern Europe where again, not impossible, but just not understanding as much of the nuances, the culture and these things that makes them move that much slower. So I think there, number one, there is regulatory protection just to make the domestic markets grow. And then number two is not understanding and having boots on the ground that would allow them to get the market and understand it to move that much faster. Again, not impossible things to overcome, but a lot, uh, makes them move that much slower. And quick follow up on that. When you're looking at that regulatory barrier in order to encourage domestic markets and production, are there other categories other than just fintech that you see running into that same type of regulatory protection? Yes, there is. And uh, I think it it can be a double edged sword. So it, it goes into all uh, many different industries. So even on the agricultural side where there is very little tech, but again, this is where uh, the, I, I believe the companies that we've seen and the ones that we're investing in understand that this moat is not going to be something that they can continue to rely on in the future. It is just something to incubate them for a little while. And then at some point, the markets will have to be more flat and there can't be these kinds of protections. But in the beginning, there are to just give them that much more of a he head start here. You earlier listed a really diverse set of countries and markets that you've engaged in. Are there, are there any parts of the continent that you've just ruled out, at least for now? And maybe not for hard and fast rule, but are there are there parts where you're more reluctant to engage with? Um, I don't think uh, Illuminate, I, Illuminate and I have ever uh, chosen a specific country. So we are truly, truly uh, just excited to work with anyone. So. There is no country that we are not willing to work with. So we're, we're open to anyone. This question comes from Andrew. How do you, and we asked kind of a version of this, but this is getting a little more specific. Sure. How do you evaluate the risk of follow-on funding for early stage African startups, given the fact that the ecosystem is still less developed and, ca and capitalized than more mature markets. So to your point, your firm isn't doing this. So let's just ask this, let's just take this as an investor seeking advice from their perspective, they wanna engage a follow on funding. Yeah, so what I've seen from investing, angel investing into European and North American companies versus the African uh, side is that it seems that traction happens that much faster because they know if they cannot get any real numbers on the on the board and have those real metrics to rely on their company's dead there's no there's no uh you know wide angel pull to get more funds from to create a bridging round or whatever um, um whatever new round name there is now that they have to act they have to show real metrics and so there's that 
I think, more real ticking clock there as opposed to maybe if you're in New York City and you can just keep going on year after year with just the hope that something you're going to get to product market fit there. So that's where for us, because most of our portfolio is pre-seed then seed, uh, right after that, we see traction happening because they're not raising large rounds like you would see there. Um, the mature markets, uh, their mature counterparts are doing. You got at this a bit ago when you were talking about the Chinese infrastructure investment, but how would you really categorize or compare or contrast North American versus East Asian and European investment in these spaces? Hmm. So I think I think we still do the same thing like any other GP or angel investor would be doing um, wherever they are. It really comes down to the team, uh, comes down to the problem that they're trying to solve. And that's really it. It just happens that uh, they are in a African country as opposed to anything else. So we still look at the fundamentals there and then we go and they are also in Uganda or and they are also in South Africa. So that's really how we view it as opposed to, let's say, saying the country first and then moving down and checking out what else it makes makes the startup that much more likely to succeed. So three last directionally big questions here. So so number one, you made you made reference to emerging markets earlier. There, there are emerging markets beyond just Africa. So for anyone listening, this isn't just a, a set of ideas which could solely apply to the African continent. There's also Latin America, South Asia, Southeast Asia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How should folks just conceptually think about the opportunity around emerging markets versus more obvious investment opportunities? Hmm. I think I might be stretching myself trying to slice this away from emerging to mature. Uh, Voltron's framework that we go from is again, what we've just said before of just the founding team and the problem. But on the emerging side, it is understanding. And I guess on the FinTech and crypto side, really understanding what is that What is that edge now? Where, where are they kind of living in both worlds here of this is something that is potentially leapfrog and we've never seen anything like this before, or this is why they can succeed, even though this is going to now just be potentially a copy and paste of something you would see in the mature market. And so this is now where uh, we would move over to the execution side of really seeing how these entrepreneurs move quickly and then go as I mentioned before, from that, just we're raising funding to actually putting numbers on the board and making metrics move up and to the right there, where that is just the only thing we get them to focus on next after the funding. And for the last question here, when you were at angel investing in the continent, how did you how did you source deals? How how do you how do you advise folks think about the angel side, which eventually led you into the more aggressive venture side? But if you're starting out as an angel investor, let's say you have some type of engagement with the continent in some country, how how should they think about deal sourcing? I think I think this answer will probably be the same again, irrespective of geography. Is just leaning into where you're strong. Uh, for us, we had we have engineering in. In Accra, um, I had professional networks in Johannesburg, I had family in Lagos and just leaning there and just getting involved in the community. And every time I uh, would fly in, would uh, meet with people and just meeting that person led to meeting another cool person, which met, led to the next thing. And so it was just trying to deepen um, as much as I can my relationships as well as just giving first and making sure that I could just say, hey, I can connect you with this guy or just um, helping out with whatever I could. And that allowed me to be a trusted person as opposed to just some random stranger that comes in every quarter on a plane and disappears later on. So just really trying to connect the dots from wherever I lived. 
here's what I'd love to close out with. I would love to hear a really, you know, some type of request for startups, some type of encouragement for for founders, just any type of what are what is what what should a prospective founder or current founder who's listening to this really think about moving forward? For us, we're always looking at how can a team create the outcomes? So we love the narrative. We love the fact that they're pitching us a beautiful deck and they're this, you have this wonderful story at the end. Um, but we really want the founders to really focus on the outcome. We just happen to be riding uh, with next to them, but they're the ones that are really executing. And so we're, we're always asking them to focus. The default answer is going to be no to lots of things and just really, really focusing and getting those outcomes from uh, paper and words to actual reality there. So focus on the outcomes and make, make, make the deck become a real, a real reality. I was a little unfair and so that was the last question. I have the actual last question, which is, and this yes. is for the angel investors in the audience. Yeah. How can you add value beyond just money when it comes to the problem sets that your founders are encountering? So uh, for us, we've done a variety of things, whether that's connecting them up with customers because of within our portfolio now, we have people that could, um, I guess it becomes this virtuous cycle there where we can refer to um, whether that's helping out from a marketing perspective to even going in as deep and just checking out their sales process and understanding what that is like and being able to uh, change a few things, tweak a few things, and then moving from there. So that's where we really want to add value beyond the money. Uh, money is usually the easiest thing. And so we want to try to add value of how do we now help this in investment? Of course, we're incentivized to do that, but more importantly, getting the company to succeed here. Abe, this has been incredibly excellent. Unless there are any immediate questions um, in the audience, I think that is a excellent live event, but it's also a great podcast. Oh man, what's what, where should people go next? Like beyond beyond just like you know your, your segment, what, what are just resources, ideas, anything compelling for someone who's heard and listened to this and said, "I want to engage further in this space." Like, what's the great next resource or step you could think of? Yeah, I, I think it's really reaching out to people that are in these communities. So anyone can reach out to me. I'm happy to share what I know, but it's really just leaning in and really trying to getting to know and, and understanding that you know nothing. And because you know nothing, you're willing to learn as much as you can and take in what you can. So whether that's just from the small things of why uh, something's, uh, why the uh, cuisine is different for that reason. And then just being able to pick up on all these small things to get people to realize, Hey, you're not a, you're not a tourist. You're actually in it for the long haul and you're really here to contribute there. So happy to help anyone else out there, but it's just being human, just being kind and really wanting and having that natural curiosity to understand why things are the way they are. Well, this is very generous you giving your time, Abe, and taking the promises of last questions, but the questions continued. So thank you so much for joining us no on the deep end. I know everyone here got a lot out of this. Thank you for having me.